Definitely, you know, dialysis is a is a temporary thing, you know. It's a downhill slope. The longer you're on dialysis, the sicker you get. And when you get a kidney, it's a new lease on life, you know. You can do more, you can have more fun. And you know, I'm still young, I got things to do. Well, before I had, I started with dialysis, I had, um, I always had kidney problems. But that was because I have lupus, and that affects your bodies and it affected my kidneys. And then last year, around about, my kidneys stopped working properly, and then I had to be put on dialysis. I was very, very sick in the mornings, and then I was fine in the afternoons. You're going to get a kidney. You're most probably going to get a kidney because when you're younger, they give it to you more. And it's, it's not easy, yes, but remember, it teaches you character, it teaches you to be stronger, because hardships make you stronger. So don't worry. You are a fighter, you are a warrior, and you will get better. It's, it's, it's not something that you must say, I'm sick, I'm sick, and sit at home. You must go out and you must love your life. Do the best you can. Chronic kidney disease is likely to be the fifth leading cause of years of life lost by year 2040. Now, an estimated 850 million people worldwide have chronic kidney disease, and in South Africa, estimates are that there are more than 6 million people living with this condition. Now, sadly, about 9 out of 10 people who have chronic kidney disease may not even know about the fact that they have the condition. Now, about 10.5 million people need dialysis or a kidney transplant. Now, chronic kidney disease causes at least 2.4 million deaths per year and is now the sixth fastest growing cause of death. World Kidney is celebrated on the 14th of March and the theme for 2019 is Kidney Health for Everyone, Everywhere, aiming to highlight the growing burden of kidney disease and kidney health disparity and inequity worldwide. So it's for that reason that today we're discussing kidney disease. We're joined in studio by a nephrologist and a representative from the National Kidney Foundation of South Africa, trust manager from Kidney Beans Trust, a nutritionist, a transplant coordinator, a kidney recipient, and a kidney donor who's a sister of the recipient, and a dialysis patient awaiting a kidney transplant. You can tweet us at SABC Health Talk, or simply just interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. So sit back, relax, and learn from this bumper show coming to you just after a short break. I'm Dr. Salam Mikhail, and this is Health Talk. Momentum. We're all born with it. No matter where life takes us, Momentum protects us and repairs what's been damaged. Momentum Car Insurance gives you up to 30% cash back on your premiums every year, even if you claim. SMS car to 42024 or speak to your financial advisor for a quote. That's why we're here for you. Ooh, I got shooting star, I go. Like a shooting star, I go. Pambili when Dabazo says why Ukona to turn that frown upside down. We'll agree that the best way to spread a story is to include more people. Obsessed with the best of the best when it comes to Umkosi. Catch RGB Saturdays at half past seven only on SABC One Mzansi for sure. Children with life threatening kidney disease often experience great difficulty in living normal lives that is according to the Kidney Beans Trust. The trust was established to provide comprehensive support services to these children and their families. We sat down with the kids to get their understanding of kidney failure. First to talk to us was Mohammed Yusuf Pamji. I was diagnosed with uh, chronic kidney disease when I was about four months old and when I was four months old, yeah, they, they said that I have a reflux. My urine wasn't coming out, it was going back up to the kidney and damaging the kidney. So by the time they found that out, half of both of my kidneys were dead. And then when I turned 12, they both failed completely and I started dialysis. Living on dialysis from an early age can be daunting, 
but Mohammed is managing to live with his condition with a positive spirit. You know, it's got its ups, it's got its downs, you know. Dialysis, it's, 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 it affects your body negatively and positively, you know, because your body's weaker, you can't do as much, and that, that also hurts, but other than that, you know, it's, it's kind of cool when, when you beat the healthy kids in sports, that's awesome. Mohammed's diet has drastically changed because people with advanced kidney disease need to follow a kidney-friendly diet. Mostly, like, what has changed is back in the day I could eat a lot more stuff, but now I, I gotta restrict my, especially like stuff like processed food is practically no. Steaks, red meat is little, but you gotta reduce the amount of water you take in, of course. So, like, I'm allowed about two to three liters of water a day. This is Ellen. He developed kidney failure when he was young due to a disease called lupus. He is also on dialysis. Well, I know that it like works as an artificial kidney, and then like it filters, it gets rid of all like extra water and toxins that your kidneys no longer do. Due to his condition, Ellen isn't likely to get a new kidney, and Mohammed is on the list awaiting a donor. Well, I have lupus, and then in order for me to be put on the list, it mustn't be active for a year and a year and a half. And then if then they'll think about putting me on the list. Nobody in my family made a match, so that is practically impossible. But I am on the list. I'm around in the top 50, I think. And yeah, I've been waiting for a long time. They can give me one by now. While kidney disease can affect anyone at any age, children diagnosed with kidney disease need special consideration and care. It is important to learn about kidney disease and how to manage it. And that's exactly what we're going to be, what we're going to be learning about today, kidney disease. It's a great pleasure to welcome our, our guest for today. First is Dr. Malcolm Davis. Dr. Davis is a nephrologist who's based at Helen Joseph Hospital and is also a representative of the National Kidney Foundation of South Africa. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Thank Davis. Thank you very much. Right. And next to Dr. Davis, we have Stacy Hanekom. Stacy is the trust manager from the Kidney Beans Trust that we heard about earlier. Welcome to her talk, Tracy. Thank you for having me. All right. We're going to come back to you and talk a little bit about the Kidney Beans Trust just to learn more about it. But, Dr. Davis, let's start with you. Uh, why, why do we need kidneys? What, what, are they, what are they there for and why do we need two of them? Well, the kidneys are one of the most important organs that we have in the body and they, they uh, undertake a variety of functions, um, including regulation of one's fluid balance. So as we heard in the insert, yeah. um, patients with kidney disease are not able to regulate their fluid status very well. They also are the major route through which the body processes out protein-based toxins. And they play an important role in uh, regulating the acid-base balance in a patient, as well as control of certain important salts within the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And then they have also a variety of endocrine functions or hormone-based functions. Um, and the ones of particular importance are that they have important effects in terms of one's bone health and the parathyroid hormone system, as well as um, assisting the body to make red blood cells mm. um, to keep one's blood uh, or one's HB within a normal range. So they, may, they play quite a major role then in our lives. We, is, what you're saying basically is that we cannot do without kidneys. We, we cannot live without a functioning kidney. Right. And, and, and why do we need two? Well, it has to do with the uh, volume of blood that has to be filtered by the, by the body within a 24-hour period. And obviously, the more functioning tissue we have, the more we are able to um, process out those toxins and fluid. Yeah. But having said that, it is possible to live a completely normal life with only one kidney. Right. Um, and that's the basis of transplantation, which I'm sure we'll discuss later. Okay, talk about that. Then let's go into what can go wrong with the kidneys. Obviously, that's the subject for today's show, kidney disease. Uh, can you just take us through what can go wrong with the kidneys in terms of, you know, disease, obviously? So broadly speaking, there are two large categories of kidney disease. Um, we, we call them acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. Yeah. Acute kidney injury is where there's been uh, damage to the kidney within a three-month period, and that is usually reversible and improves once you're able to address the underlying cause of the kidney damage. Uh, chronic kidney disease is where you've had ongoing damage to the kidney for more than three months, mm. and that is 
uh, difficult to completely reverse, but in many cases we're able to slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease over time, uh, with the aim being that we can keep patients off dialysis for as long as possible and preferably avoid dialysis as much as possible. Yeah. In, in the beginning, I, in my introduction, I mean, I quoted some statistics. Can, do we know exactly, you know, the extent of this condition in South Africa? We don't, actually. Um, yeah. The most recent uh, statistics we have come from our colleagues in the Western Cape who analyzed uh, prevalence in about 2004, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Um, and we estimate from that that about 500 people per million have yeah. severe enough kidney disease that they should be on dialysis, which yeah. in South Africa means there should be about 25,000 patients on dialysis. Right. Um, for earlier stages of chronic kidney disease, which are asymptomatic or do not have significant enough symptoms for the patient to consult a doctor, yeah. we have no idea how common that level of kidney damage is. In fact, I'd like us to come back to those symptoms, but before that, let's speak to uh, Stacy. Stacy, um, firstly, we spoke about statistics, you know, first tell us about what Kidney Beans Trust is, what you guys do, and what are the so common um, sort of conditions that you see, what, what's, what's the extent of this problem in terms of, you know, the patient load that you have? Um, well, the Kidney Beans Trust was started in about 2007 uh, to supply support services for kids on dialysis or with kidney disease. Because um, as we also heard earlier on, they need to follow a certain diet. Some mm. of them um, can't physically do a lot of mobility. So we have physios that can try and come and assist, psychologists to help them deal with what they're going through pre and post transplants. Mm -hmm. And also not just them, but the families and the siblings, because it's, 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 a, it's a, a big change for everyone yeah. and once they're diagnosed. And also when they go into dialysis, it's, it's so quite a change. So you only look at, at kids, essentially? Yes, we do pediatric uh, what we do for pediatrics. Pediatrics. Yes. All right. So, so let's come back to symptoms then. People are probably wondering, mm, how will I know if I have signs of kidney disease? Well, that's as we said. The difficulty is that very often the presentation or the development of the signs is really in the final stages of kidney disease when the damage to the kidneys is very advanced. Yeah. But in those circumstances, one might note a swelling of the feet or of the eyes, for example. You may have feelings of lethargy or tiredness, strange tastes in the mouth, often described as metallic, um, itching skin, and what we term photosensitivity, which means if you go in the sunlight, the itching is worse, um, and a general feeling of malaise or, un or lack of wellness, um, as well as loss of appetite. Mm -hmm. and, and what's the long-term prognosis of someone d diagnosed with chronic kidney disease? I know we're going to be talking about treatment later on, but I mean, what are we saying? Is kidney disease treatable? It is treatable. It very much depends on the underlying cause, um, as well as how advanced the kidney disease is when the patient presents to the specialist. And obviously it's preferable that a patient gets referred earlier because we're able to intervene and right. slow down the rate of progression much better. Right. Tracy, just last question, just whilst you have you here. The Kidney Beans Trust, is it, is it a private entity or is it a not-for-profit? Where are you? are you? Do you only see private patients? We are a non-profit organization. Um, yeah. We see both public and private. So the doctor um, whose unit we work out of is from a private hospital um, in Morningside, but we do financially try and support um, families at the Charlotte Mekke um, yeah. Hospital, and we're trying to branch out to other public hospitals where they need assistance. All right. and we're trying to get there. Okay. Before we go on a break, I believe we have a caller, Emil, from Cape Town. Emil, welcome to Health Talk. Hello, hi. Hi, welcome. Hi, so I just want to know um, if it is, what is... Um, is there any side effects that can affect your kidneys if you are on any side of any any sort of um, anabolic steroids? Okay, excellent question. Do you want to just take that? Now I'll tell you what. Can, because it's time for us to go for a break. Please keep that in mind. When we come back, we'll try and provide an answer. All right, time for a quick break. When we come back, we we'll continue our discussion on kidney diseases. It's time to find out what are the risk factors. This week on Trends Travel, a gourmet three-course meal with a unique pairing. Be on the lookout for our new exciting book review session, which kicks off with Jackie Pamato's new offering, I Tweet What I Like. 
We got to meet the talented cast of the Soweto Theatre's amazing production, The Magic of Sophia Town, and it's the perfect family show for these school holidays. All this and more this week on Trends Travel on Saturdays at 5.30 p.m. We've heard it many times from female entrepreneurs that they aren't taken seriously and Future Females is a worldwide network of women. So we're creating a platform where these women come and they collaborate and they meet each other. Have the uh, Civil Aviation Authority announced when they'll be making some announcement with regard to findings? The Chief Executive Officer of Ethiopian Airlines he said they do not even know the magnitude of the situation. Bring us up to speed with regard to the latest developments. We now know there was a football official, there was a journalists to our university professors. Coco said his hands are clean and his detractors have ulterior motives. South Africans have been sold it and that Machela Coco had conflict of interest. Our election website here on SABC is now live. It is worrying indeed when any publication has to close down. So it is really getting tough from the point of view of lack of sufficient readership to the issue of social media. How influential is the media still? Twitter, Facebook are influencing people far more than uh, mainstream newspapers nowadays. The media has greater responsibility compared to Twitter. The media itself is governed by certain codes and it must abide by those codes. Threatened, attacked and killed, journalists are also being imprisoned in record numbers around the world. If you mention and name particular journalists, you actually put them at risk. We were media activists, and I, I believe we still are today. A journalist is an endangered species today. Watch Media Monitor, Sundays at 9 a.m. Welcome back. So today we're discussing chronic kidney disease with our guest, Dr. Malcolm Davis a specialist nephrologist based at Helen Joseph Hospital, and he's also representing the National Kidney Foundation of South Africa. Now we're joined by two other special guests. Uh, the lady in the middle is Kisinteng Ndlovu, uh, who is a sister of the gentleman that you see across there, uh, Karabo Ndlovu. To both of you, welcome to Health Talk, and thank you for... Thank you. Right. right. Thank okay. You. We're going to learn more about you, but Dr. Davis, let's just go back to that call. Sure. steroids because I think it links into causes and risk factors for kidney disease. So yes indeed anabolic steroids can damage the kidney. Yeah. Um, they can damage the kidney in two ways. The one is that the bulking of muscle which develops with the anabolic steroid places additional strain on the kidneys in terms of dealing with an increased production of toxins. Mm. And the anabolic steroids themselves may be directly toxic towards the kidney. Mm. Um, in addition, the kind of lifestyle which goes with use of anabolic steroids, which is one with a lot of gymming, etc., exposes the patient to dehydration as well as to other medications like um, anti-inflammatories, which can also damage the kidney. So they right. certainly are not a good idea for kidneys. Okay. Well, talk about that. I, I, I guess it brings us to the whole subject of you know, risk factors and causes for kidney disease. You can start with you know, causes for the acute and then we'll go on to the chronic. So, well, acute kidney injury can be caused by a variety of conditions. The most common is, in essence, dehydration or infective processes. And nephrologists commonly see patients with acute kidney injury in a hospital setting where they're admitted with an infection somewhere or with, for example, gastroenteritis and dehydration. Yeah. We also see a number of patients with acute kidney injuries as a result of various drugs, and anti-inflammatories are particularly notorious in that mm. regard. Mm. Um, chronic kidney disease may develop from untreated acute kidney injury, but most chronic kidney disease arises on the background of a genetic predisposition. So you're born with an inherited risk for chronic kidney disease. And then you have subsequent what we call secondary hits, which are other factors which develop which can promote chronic kidney disease. And those mm. are things like commonly diabetes and hypertension. Mm. And in South Africa, HIV is also an important cause. Yeah. So our lifestyle generally has some effect on development of, of, of kidney disease, as I say. Perhaps let's just go back to that issue of uh, anti-inflammatories. Um, these are easily available. People, um, whenever you know, anybody has some sort of you know, pain anywhere in the body, they go to the pharmacy, over the counter, buy whatever, yes. lots of them. Uh, so at what point would they cause kidney disease? 
Well, in theory, you have to take quite a lot of anti-inflammatory in order to cause damage. Yeah. And the standard kind of uh, risk amount would be more than six grams, which is a, a significant amount of tablets. Mm. But um, it also depends on the context. So somebody who is dehydrated, for example, mm. like our gym uh, enthusiast, yeah. um, who takes anti-inflammatories on the background of dehydration, or a patient who's on hypertensive medication, which may include a diuretic, which yeah. also acts as a dehydrating agent, yeah. who then takes anti-inflammatories, would be at higher risk of developing kidney damage from the anti-inflammatories. Yeah. And there are a group of people who develop idiosyncratic, as we call them, reactions to the anti-inflammatories, which means that they cannot be um, very well predicted, yeah. um, and those patients are at increased risk of developing kidney damage from, from even mild or, or for, from very little anti-inflammatory use. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about other conditions associated with chronic disease. You mentioned HIV on the infective side, but the other diseases of lifestyle, diabetes, hypertension, how do they accelerate you know, uh, kidney disease? Well, the interaction between diabetes and hypertension and chronic kidney disease is a very complex one. Um, in essence, you are born with a background predisposition towards chronic kidney disease. And in the African context, in sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa where we are, um, there is a mutation called the APOL1 MYH9 mutation, which is very common amongst um, black Africans of sub-Saharan African descent, um, which is a predisposing factor towards chronic kidney disease. Right. And if one then develops a secondary hit, like diabetes or hypertension on top of that, in essence those diseases place additional strain on the kidney mm -hmm. and result in accelerated damage to the kidney over time. Okay, last question before I speak to my two other guests. Drugs, alcohol, substance abuse, any effect? There are indeed a number of recreational substances which are dangerous for the kidney. Um, cocaine and heroin are not good. And um, anything with amphetamine in it, which can act as a dehydrating agent and promote another condition which we call rhabdomyolysis, which is breakdown of muscle tissue, yeah. which um, causes exposure of the kidneys to toxins released from muscle cells, yeah. is also, uh, also carries the risk of causing kidney damage. Yeah. All right. I hope our caller from Cape Town got it very clear that taking steroids is just a no-no, that it's going to damage your kidneys in the end. But let's speak to our, uh, our two guests here. Let's start off with Karabo. Yeah, well, well. Nijar. Ah, spile, lam, tam, ta. Why are you wearing the mask, Karabu? Uh, the mask is to protect myself uh, from um, infections, uh, my germs and stuff. Yes. Jango bangsa, the immune system, yam sa se suppressed. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, 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 so tell us about yourself. You, you, you had, I mean, obviously, you, you, this is protective, you know, obviously, to, to protect your, your more, immune system. You, you, you had kidney disease for, for, for a while, and you had a... A, a kidney donated by your sister sitting yeah, next mama. to you. But let's start off by when were you diagnosed with kidney disease? Uh, I was diagnosed in 2016. Right. July the 15th. Right. Yeah. On, yeah. I was diagnosed then that started hemodialysis. Yeah. Then from hemo, I had to move to PD. Yeah. PD then, now is peritoneal dialysis. Yes, for, peritoneal yeah, okay, dialysis. We'll explain that later for our, Peritoneal yeah. didn't work for me. Yeah. I had to return to hemodialysis again. Right. Until 2017, uh, she offered uh, to donate for me 2017 around April. Right. Then that's when she started the whole wake up process and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and how does it feel now that you, you, you have a kidney that you received from your sister? What does it mean to you? Yeah, I can't thank you enough. Right. Yeah. You right. just can't say I owe her, but you know, it means everything. Yeah. I know dialysis life is not nice yeah. for anyone. Right. Uh, I would say on the other hand, like, she said to me later on. Yeah. Yeah, she... Right, right. Yeah, right, right. Because so you, you, you can't thank her enough. She's she's really saved your life, in other words. Ah, you. She yeah. was there from day one. Okay, let's hear from her, Kissing Thing. Yes. Um, tell us about what you went through. Firstly, understanding that your brother has kidney disease. Okay. Um, at first, um, before I even offered to donate for him, hmm. I was going being attended at my support groups at Helen Joseph. Yes. And then that's when I understood the, uh, the whole concept of 
donating because I wasn't aware of anything. Right. Because uh, even in our society, you don't talk about donations, you right. know, and you don't know anything. Right. So, yeah, then that's when gay matters, and you know what? Because he's now like that, uh, diagnosed with a uh, kidney failure, I'll donate for him. Okay. Yes. And, and was it an easy decision for you to, to take? Were you not scared that you're going to be now without, left with only one kidney? Um, at first, uh, it was so hard for me. Mm. I don't want to tell lies. It was so hard because. I have a partner, he yeah. needs to understand. Okay, my family was supportive, but I had like difficulties afterwards, like um, with my workplace, what, uh, what will they, like will they allow me to work afterwards with one kidney or you know, right. such things, but afterwards I was fine. Well, well, that's really my next question to say, how do you feel now? that you know you've donated a kidney so so has your life changed in any way before and after no 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 no. nothing has changed because even after the the transplant i was only given like few medication and i was expecting a lot and yeah. i thought even my diet will change but nothing has changed so i'm fine i'm still myself i don't feel anything missing so i'm still normal do you, so so in terms of your lifestyle now do you, do you live a particular lifestyle to protect just the one kidney that you have? Yes, I do. Like, um, <laughs> actually, Karabo is always reminding me to drink lots of water, of which it was like I wasn't drinking enough mm. at first, but now I have to. And I'm so glad with my boss, Angela, because like whenever she's drinking water, she comes with a, with a glass and yeah. says to me, take, this right. is your glass of water. So yeah, and healthy eating also. Okay. Yes. You don't abuse alcohol, no, you don't no, no. do drugs, no, no, you don't no. do all don't sorts smoke. of things. No, you, no, no. Right. Yeah. Well, this is, this is, perhaps just, just the last question in the last 30 seconds or so. Where to from here? So, well, where to from here is that um, our donor will continue to follow up with us. Um, initially, we follow up every kind of three to six months, but with time, provided that her renal function remains stable, we see her every year or more. Mm -hmm. And that's a preventative management to watch for the development of high blood pressure or of kidney dysfunction in the long term. Yeah. For donors, the prognosis is excellent. And in fact, donors are generally much healthier than the general population because we specifically select for healthy patients. Right. And so donors tend to live longer than people who don't donate. And for the recipient? And for the recipient, the initial period is very intense monitoring as we um, uh, control immunosuppression and watch to make sure there's no rejection. But once we pass the kind of first three-month period, we start to reduce immunosuppression and minimize the number of drugs that the recipient is taking, mm. which is not to say that you'll ever be able to completely stop the number of drugs or, or stop the drugs completely, but we can certainly bring down the load. Um, and then we continue to follow up in the state practice. We see these uh, patients who've received a kidney um, every three months or so, and that's okay. to monitor for rejection and make sure the kidney's right. working well. All right, Kisensing and Karabundlovu, I can really wish you all the best going forward. Thank you. And all the best, especially to both of you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you. All right, time for another quick break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion on chronic kidney disease. Please stay with us. The redistribution of one's profitable farmland is dominated by corrupt dealings. The problem with land reform is it, it's the state who's stealing people's land and it's the state who is diverting the budget that was meant to be used for land reform to partners that provide kickbacks. As elections approach, we ask what this corruption is costing our country and whether it can be curtailed. Watch Special Assignment on Sunday night at 9.30. Primetime is the definitive show that brings you the lowdown on cinema. Music. Art. Recently, 50 makeup artists from around the country watched their art pieces grace the stage in the annual Fantasia body painting competition held in Johannesburg. The results, quite revealing. And sport. Drop a goal. He's got it. The post. Keller goes in top. And it will score. Oh, what a try. Magnificent play from the Australian 5 -8. Catch prime time.
time on SABC Encore, DSTV Channel 156, Timeless. This week on Trends Travel, a gourmet three-course meal with a unique pairing. Be on the lookout for our new exciting book review session, which kicks off with Jackie Pamato's new offering, I Tweet What I Like. We got to meet the talented cast of the Soweto Theatre's amazing production, The Magic of Sophia Town, and it's the perfect family show for these school holidays. All this and more this week on Trends Travel on Saturdays at 5.30pm. When you put five girls against five guys, of course it's going to be lit. Andile, what's the next challenge? Don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Witness all the fun, tension and laughs as we see how well friends know each other to win a luxury cruise. Lordalo. Join us as we bring the excitement every weekend at 6 p.m. Only on SABC One. Mzanti for sure. Welcome back. We're talking kidney disease with our guest, Dr. Malcolm Davis, nephrologist at Helen Joseph Hospital and representative of the National Kidney Foundation of South Africa. And we're back with Stacey Hanakon, man trust manager from the uh, Kidney Beans Trust. And we're now joined by Vosi Seape, who's no stranger to this show, a, a <laughs> nutritionist based in Soshanguve in Pretoria. Welcome to Health Talk once again. Vosie. Thanks, Dr. Salon. Also, thanks to the viewers at home. All right. So, so let's come back. Let's start with you then, um, uh, Dr. Davis. We, we, now having understood the causes and some of the you know, common uh, risk factors, as it were, um, can we really talk about prevention? Well, we can to some extent. Right. Um, if you have a condition like diabetes or hypertension, it's important that you are screened for kidney disease. Yeah. Um, and that's a simple blood and urine test. Um, and if you have some degree of kidney dysfunction, it's important that you see a specialist so that we can make interventions early and prevent progression. Yeah. But certainly um, control of sugar diabetes and control of blood pressure are very important in preventing the development of chronic kidney disease. Yeah. So, so how about lifestyle, um, particularly if you know, we're talking people who are at risk of having hypertension and diabetes, um, in terms of what is it that they can do uh, just even in, I mean, we spoke about screening and, you know, mm -hmm. for, for, for kidney disease, but general lifestyle issues that people, what, what sort of lifestyle can people follow? Well, a normal healthy lifestyle is what we really need. That's so, what I want us to talk about. So, what, what does that so, entail? Um, keeping your weight under control with mm -hmm. exercise, um, trying to cut down on salt, which can contribute to the development of high blood pressure, yeah. and eating a healthy diet, one which is kind of, um, less likely to cause the development of obesity yeah. um, would be very important factors. Right, right. We're going to put that question to uh, Vosi Serp now, but let's take Dingane uh, from Johannesburg. Dingane, welcome. Hello, good day, sir. Yes, Dingane, can you speak a little louder, please? Yeah. I just wanted to find out something. I have registered as a donor. Yes. Uh, more than 15 or 12 years back. Right. So what I want to find out from the foundation is that if a person has, has registered, do you have to re-register again to be a donor? Because I was registered and I was given a, a date donor status at that time, but I've, I've never donated anything. Okay, good question. Let's, let's put you. it to Dr. Davis. Yeah? No, you don't have to re-register. What's really important though is if you have made the decision to become a donor, that you inform your family so that in the event that something happens to you and you're not able to speak to for yourself, mm. that your family is aware of your wishes and yeah. able to fulfill them on your part. All right, okay. So let's get back to that lifestyle issue now. We, we, mm. We're talking prevention. We, we've emphasized, we always talk about, you know, know your numbers, screen and, and all of that. But let's remind people about, you know, lifestyle issues, especially around nutrition. Yes. Dr. Davis mentioned salt intake, yeah? Definitely, yeah. When we're looking at salt, it's quite very important for one to start reducing a bit of salt, especially when we look at the processed foods that are actually very high in sodium already. So uh, a lot of people could start uh, having the alternatives instead of you cooking with salt. Rather have the alternatives of using the herbs, uh, like the likes of rosemary, paprika, turmeric, just for seasoning purposes. Because if you just yeah. tell somebody that 
cut on salt. And then somebody would say, my food is not going to taste good at, at some point. Yeah. So it's quite important for one to reduce that because we have noticed that uh, mm. it also prevents that a lot of that swelling that could be there because of the fluid balancing in the body. And very importantly that uh, one should also look at the potassium rich foods and the phosphorus rich foods as well. Like for the likes of potassium rich foods, we're looking at about tomatoes, uh, for instance, pumpkin, Asparagus, we can name a lot of them, yeah. just to be cautious when we, we, you put them on your diet as well. And the phosphorus, looking at your colors, you know, organ meats, you know, in, especially in our, our African nature, they eat a lot of like organ meats, liver, kidneys, and stuff, you know what I mean? I can mention few. Yeah. So it's quite important for one to really look at that as well. And, so and in terms of, in terms of um, the, the carbohydrates, one will want to look at more on um, the ones that are a bit white and instead of the brown cups because of the potassium and the phosphorus uh, balance on them as well. So it's very important for... for so so let's clarify that. Yes. So, so what are you saying? People in terms of going towards more brownish ones as, as compared yeah, to because white? Because if you look at um, in terms of the brown um, um, starches, they tend to have more of potassium in yes. them as compared to the white starches. So when yeah. somebody is actually diagnosed with a kidney problem, we need we need us to look at that as well. So we rather go on the refined caps in, in, in instead of the the complex ones. That's quite interesting. Yeah, we normally yeah. Uh, you know advise yeah. the opposite to yes. say white yeah. avoid white bread rather have yeah. you know brown bread. But yeah, it becomes when you it becomes a bit it becomes a bit difficult when we've got a, a renal diabetic patient. Yeah. <laughs> so because in diabetes actually contravene with. They get the kidney diet because yeah. in di diabetic it tells you eat all the brains and the whole wheat and everything. But when it comes to the kidneys, it's very important to get the balance between the two, right. so that we don't overload a lot. Stacey, how do you manage with, with, with young children? I mean, obviously you you, you deal with um, a lot with young children um, awaiting um, you know kidney transplant on dialysis. Just generally, uh, what sort of discussions do you have with parents? Well, we have a dietitian that will come and assess the individuals, um, roughly ask them what it is they are eating, we're eating, mm -hmm. and sort of give them individual eating plans. Mm -hmm. um, we then do talk to the, the parents and say, well, it would probably be more advisable for the whole family to follow a similar eating plan. So it's mm -hmm. not just being isolated, you eat this and we as a family will eat the rest. So it's also a whole psychological thing that we have to then get the psychologist in to come also sort of explain. Mm. Um, it is hard because they also want to be able to eat like sweets and chocolates like any other mm. child would. So I know occasionally they are allowed to mm. eat a certain type of marshmallows, white marshmallows yes, and that yes. sort of thing mm. as a treat. Mm. So we do sort of work that into their diets. Yeah. Um, but yes, we, we, you, can't, you can't overdo it. Yeah. Nutrition is a, a, a difficult subject, isn't it? It's so, very difficult. Um, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I'd like your opinion on, 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 on the, how, how easy it is to get people, especially people, I mean, you know, you, nutrition is a lifestyle. People get used to eating certain types of foods. Mm -hmm. And in your interaction with, with these patients, how easy is it to steer them in, in the right sort of direction? As it? It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, though, which does help is um, if we, and which we certainly do, is we refer our patients to, to a dietitian. dietitian yes. The idea being that everybody's diet needs to be tapered as much or tailored as much as possible to yeah. their particular lifestyle and, and has to take into account um, what they can afford to yeah. purchase mm. food-wise, mm. as well as how bad their kidney problem is mm. and what particular complications we have in terms of potassium and phosphate mm. control, for example. Mm. Um, and we also have to take into account that many patients with advanced kidney disease are actually malnourished. Mm. And so it's not so simple as saying you must steer clear of all red meat or protein because mm. some patients may require a bit of protein in order yeah. to build up their muscle reserves. Mm. Yeah. Stacey, we, we spoke a little earlier um, during one of the breaks about, you know, the Kidney Beans Trust. You said it's a non-profit organization um, and you based, how many centers do you have around the country? We've got one center. We are based from the Morningside Mediclinic, yeah. which is where our offices are. Yes. Um, but then we do support, as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, uh, um, some of the public hospitals. Our funding is purely from sponsors' donations, so some, some months may be good and we can sort of offer more services to some of the hospitals, yeah. and some months we can't, so um, we do certain drives just to sort of promote awareness um, at schools as well, starting at, at a young age. Yeah. Um, and yeah. how do you raise funds? 
We raise funds through we doing a sticker drive. So um, we're sending stickers for World Kidney Day tomorrow. Um, so that will then go into the trust to assist with transport and so on. We do golf days. We do um, high mm. teas for some of the moms and get them to have a day out and also just have sort of motivational speakers and that sort of thing come in. And then all the funding that comes from that, we then put towards the trust. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Just the last few seconds here, you wanted to just add a f last few words on nutrition, the importance of nutrition? Yes, um, just the, the most important thing is just to have just a balanced diet to prevent all those non-chemical diseases of lifestyle just for the prevention better than cure, you know. So if you have a good lifestyle, then you are able to prevent all those diabetes, mm -hmm. all those hypertension, because on the macro complications later, that will have a kidney problem. Mm. So it's, it's very important for one to balance on the diet, mm. and definitely, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So on that note, I think just before we go on a break, as Stacy has said, I mean it's important sometimes to um, support non-profit organisations, especially. So Kidney Beans Trust, as they say, you know, they're selling uh, stickers and they're raising funds. It's a good thing to support them. Time for another quick break. When we come back, we we'll wrap up our discussion on kidney disease. Please stay with us. Get the facts first. In 1994, I was so excited. I was For South Africa, art was never a good thing. From a footballing point of view, there was never a separation. Get to the truth. There's still some serious issues in South Africa. But I think the government has the right to try to hard to work. The apartheid in South Africa is not going to be a democracy. But you are not going to be a See what it all really means. I is geel, and this is the clear and the verkeerslag that VOC weers versichtig. I still give South Africa a hit. We are somewhere in between. We're giving our democracy a green for sure. We're very happy. It's not good, God, in those amas and they funding. Democracy Gauge, weekdays at 5.30 on SABC News, Channel 404. Complicated cases. Shubile. Your black friends might be running this country, but I'm still the government on Bataruk. Hmm. The poor child. This kid was electrocuted by your fence. Sorry, it was his own fault. I put it to you that you have a personal interest in this case. Under Section 300 of the Criminal Procedures Act 51 of 1977. I urge the court to find in favor of the plaintiff. The court finds the accused guilty. Dedicated lawyers dig to the bottom and everyone gets peace. It's a pleasing judgment and it's justice for all on SABC Anko, DSTV Channel 156. I use my name first and foremost, that's all I heard. And um, from using the name, I got a small loan of 8,000 rand. I remember there is a time la sa zamakum funelum sabinzi. Under matron Nomvete's leadership, this team is responsible for the treatment of patients who are suffering from kidney failure at Charlotte Makleke Academic Hospital. The total number of my staff establishment is about 66. And with this very same 66 staff members, I'm still running short. You cannot just take uh, somebody from uh, any any area to come and work here. It's a specialized department. The staff are trained to know that this patient are undergoing a certain pressure. So we need to deal with them uh, in a special way. This is a chronic dialysis unit whereby all our patients who are here they, they are in chronic renal failure. All our patients need, are in need of transplants. So we really need donors. We encourage everyone to be a donor because that's the only chance our patients really have. Dikit Seng Maluka was diagnosed with kidney failure over 10 years ago. Ever since then, she's been spending her Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays hooked up to this dialysis machine. The machine helps to perform the role of a kidney, removing all the harmful waste toxins from Dikaseng's blood. 
Over the years, she has formed a close bond with the hospital staff. They are really good and they are caring for us and they are very supportive because everything we need to know, they do make us understand what's going on. And before they do anything, they tell us what they're going to do and how the, pro the procedure goes. I know I'll get help and I feel at home when I'm here. So you find that some of the patients have been dialyzing here for more than 20 years. So we form a relationship. We get to know, you know, their families. We, we, there's a real bond. Sometimes you find that they really need our moral support. You know, it's not easy having renal failure. It, it really changes your life. They still want a chance at life. You know, they want to have a positive outlook at life. The staff of this renal unit go the extra mile to ensure that their patients are comfortable and well looked after. When we are doing dialysis, we are extending the life of the patient. And by extending the life of the patient, the patient can go back into the family and be a productive person. We offer ourselves, we offer our human service to our patients, we give our hearts. Yes, we give it all. All right, welcome back. We still have our guest, uh, Dr. Malcolm Davis. Now we're joined by um, two other special guests. First up is um, the gentleman in the middle, Tapiso Maine. Tapiso is a dialysis uh, patient um, awaiting a kidney transplant. Welcome to Health Talk, Tapiso. Thank you. All right. And of course, next to Tapiso is Sister Gwen Laster, who's the transplant coordinator um, and a dialysis sister based at the Helen Joseph Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Sister Cluster. Thank you, Doctor. All right. Uh, perhaps to start this discussion, let's just look at the basic principles around treatment for chronic kidney disease. We've been talking a lot about dialysis and transplant. Just take us through the principles. So the, we consider starting dialysis when the patient reaches what's called end-stage kidney disease, which is the final stage of chronic kidney disease. Before that, we make interventions to try and address the underlying damage that's happening to the kidney to stabilize it or reverse it. Um, and that involves, again, blood pressure control in the patient's diabetic sugar control, as well as a modified diet, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, once the patient reaches dialysis, um, we have, in essence, two modalities available to us, two forms of dialysis, um, peritoneal and hemodialysis, which perhaps we'll speak about later. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, dialysis does not cure the kidney problem. And the only cure for end-stage kidney disease is a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. And so that is the aim of nephrologists and uh, kidney failure patients once they reach end-stage kidney disease is to deal with the problem by replacing the failed kidney with a transplant. Mm -hmm. Okay, before I speak to Sabiso, let's speak to you, sister. Um, you, you're a, you're a, tell us about your role, I mean, as a transplant coordinator at Helen Joseph. Um, I'm actually a recipient transplant coordinator, um, meaning I'm dealing with the loving patients, uh, loving donors, and the recipient. Yeah. So I work with the non-related and related living donors. Right. I orchestrate the workup. Um, in, um, in we working together with the nephrologist. Yeah. So I get the director from them, and yeah. there is a required um, investigations that needs to be completed before the patient can be transplanted. Yeah. And they oversee all the investigations, the reports received to see if this patient qualifies for the transplantation. So, so it's matching those that require kidneys with those that can donate. Yes. And oftentimes people can wait many, many years waiting for a kidney. On the transplant list, the cadaveric list, yes. Um, they can wait up to 10 years. Hmm. Um, we, um, the patients on the list is um, from public and private sector in Gauteng and Northwest. Hmm. And the correction doctors, Northwest, yeah, yeah. up to clerk's up is on that list. Right. And um, let, let, let's speak to Tsepiso again. Tsepiso, thank you so much, man, for agreeing to participate in our program. Okay. Tell us about yourself. When were you diagnosed with uh, <coughs> kidney it, disease? It was on last year, 2018, yes. Only yeah. last year? Only last year, yes. Oh, is it? Okay. Yes. And already you're on dialysis? I'm on dialysis, yes. So you've only been on dialysis for a few months? For a few months. Maybe yes, it's a year now. A year now? Yes. Okay. 
And t tell me about it. How, how, how does it feel to be on dialysis? What does it mean to you? Oh, it's just that I, sometimes you don't have to think about it a lot. Yeah. So that you can avoid stress and all those stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But otherwise, I mean, you live a normal life. Yes, I live a normal life. How, how often do you have to go to, for dialysis? Me, I'm using a machine for dialysis. I'm, okay. I'm using it at night only. Uh, because okay. I'm going to school. Oh, I see. How old are you, just, just by the way? I'm 18. Oh, you still go to school? Yes. And you're able to go to school on a daily basis? Yes. All right, okay. And what have you been told in terms of a transplant? They said I must ask a family member, my brother or someone, yeah. to donate for me. Right. I must talk to them. Okay. Yes. And? And now I talk to them, yes. Yeah. So my brother will come and donate for me. Okay. This year maybe. Okay. Yes. And they're just gonna go do some tests on your brother to see if they match. If he, yes. If he, if, if he matches yours. Yes. Okay. Sister Perhaps, let's get back to you. Yes. He says he's on peritoneal dialysis. We just heard Dr. Um, Davis introduce that subject of you know two forms of dialysis, yes. peritoneal versus hemodialysis, yes. and we had earlier. Somebody who was on, who started on hemodialysis, went to peritoneal dialysis, peritoneal dialysis didn't work for him, and he had to come back to um, hemodialysis. What's the difference between the two, and who qualifies for which one? In the public sector, our first modality that we offer is the peritoneal dialysis, yeah. because um, we don't have enough resources. So um, the, the hemodialysis is where you get the vascular access, and they connect you to a machine, a hemodialysis machine, for four hours. Yeah. And that is where the blood is pumped out of your body, the machine purifies it and put it back. Where waste is actually removed and excess fluid. Mm. Where the peritoneal dialysis is where they insert a um, soft catheter into your abdominal wall, into your peritoneum, and um, you can do it manually every four hours, every day, or um, be on the cycler machine as Tepuso is on. Um, in the public sector, we only give it to the students. So do they so do that it? they can go to school during the day. Okay. So does he have to go to a facility or can he do it at home? He does it himself at home. At home. We teach the patient. Um, first, we insert the catheter in theatre. A uh, patient is trained for a week in the hospital. Yeah. And then we make sure the patient do know how to do the procedure before they get discharged. Mm -hmm. And uh, the patient will come in there after once a month, but okay. they do the dialysis at home. All right, all right. I'll come back to you about, just to finish off, I, I just want to get back to that coordination because I want us to get into the transplant part now. Yes. Um, clearly there's a mismatch between those, the number of people that require kidneys and the ones that donate. What level of uh, awareness and, and teaching, if we can call it that, do you do to other family members, for instance, because the, our division, the, there might be lots of, you know, uh, anxieties and myths and fears around donating of kidneys. We do a lot of awareness drives. Yeah. We go um, to, so we do um, door to door, we do education um, to the community. Um, in the hospital, we plan to go to schools this year. To, our, our target is to educate young children regarding kidney disease, to eat healthy, not to do drugs, um, not to smoke. Yeah. And um, because we are receiving a lot of young children in kidney failure. Yeah. And um, that is our drive this year. So the um, awareness programs are done mostly in um, March for kidney awareness, in August for organ donor awareness. Yeah. Organ donors, there's not a lot of organ donors. People are not well informed about organ donation. Yeah. And um, we have a healthy start clinic where I see the patients from stage four and five. I educate them from there. And when they start dialysis, we encourage them to bring family members or friends yeah. to test for compatibility. Okay, all right. 
fact, last 45 seconds or so, I haven't asked you about the National Kidney Foundation of South Africa. Just in those few seconds, what do you do and, you know, how do you raise funds, if anything? It's a non-profit organization and the primary drive is to raise awareness about kidney disease and to raise awareness about um, donation amongst our South African population yeah. so that we can more effectively deal with this very common scourge. Yeah, yeah. We, we spoke just lastly, there's, there's living donors, uh, you know, is, are there cadaver donors? Yes, there are. Right. Um, so, we, so a cadaveric donor is someone who has been declared brain dead by the medical team looking after them, and under those circumstances the family may elect to yeah. donate organs. All right. And then living donors are often relatives or friends of a patient with kidney disease who come forward and want to donate their Leibniz kidneys. Like the Okay. Dr. Malcolm Davis and the Sister Cluster and Sapisa, thank you so much for your time. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. We're back on your screens in a week's time. Same place, same time. And until then, please do take care.